So the next topic we're gonna cover is uh, memory hierarchy and caching. These two dictate how, how to make your data access faster. Because one of the things about memory is while they are fast, your DRAM that you buy for your machine, they are really fast. But compared to your CPU, it's way slower, right? So here, the first thing I want to do is ask you if you have magic, how do you want your ideal memory? The first question, uh, the first answer would be, I want it to be really fast, zero latency. I want the data, the data comes right at me, right away, instantaneously, right? The second desirable goal is unlimited capacity, right? Why bother with 32 gigabyte of RAM if you have unlimited RAM, right? So that should be another ideal case, right? You want to make sure the zero cost, cheap. <laughs> the thing is, it's not cheap, right? And you also want high bandwidth. You want to be able to do a lot of parallel access to your data rather than just one access at a time you want to be able to handle like maybe 10 maybe 15 maybe 20 at the same time right but here's the problem right these four goals conflict with each other one primary conflict is the cost if you want to make your memory faster bigger or higher bandwidth it's gonna cost more right and even things like capacity, right? If you want a large memory, there'll be more structure involved when you want to get to your data. Imagine, for example, I walk into this room and I want to find someone. I can probably find that person really quickly by just looking around the room, right? But let's say you're in a stadium that can store a lot more people, right? A lot, much bigger, larger capacity, but to find someone in a stadium, it's not really easy. I mean, your one option is walk around until you realize that's not, not a good option, right? The next thing is maybe look at the section that the person might be in, then go to the row and then search the row, right? So there are more steps involved that would increase the latency, which is the time it takes to get to your data. And the bigger your memory becomes, there might be a chance, a pretty high chance that it'll take more time to access those data unless you do with, with, with the same design, essentially, right? Um, also bandwidth. If you want to, to support a lot of parallel access, right? Uh, can we get the same speed or not? Obviously it's not gonna be the same cost. It'd be cost, it will cost more. Uh, anyone built your own computer before, or at least buy a uh, memory and plug it into your computer before? Yeah, actually, like, yeah. for instance, if you buy, like, let's say you have already 16 or 2 gigabytes, right? If you buy two more, because there's more memory, it's the same thing. Uh, that's a great question. The thing is, in that case, let's say your motherboard can support four slots, right? Mm -hmm. And you buy two more and plug it in those two additional slots. It's not going to be slower because you actually connect them through different inter like it, this is a physical channel from your CPU to go to your DRAM. And when I say channel, to be honest, on your motherboard, if you look at it, you might notice that different color for your RAM slot, right? Uh, if you look at the manual, it would say channel zero and channel one. And two of the slots will share channel zero, the other two share channel one. I think that's the common setup, right? Uh, each channel, think of it as its own physical separate channel that can stream data in and out. Each channel has its own internal clock that operate your memory. And basically when you buy two more RAM to plug it in, right? Those two additional DRAM dim the, the the thing that the, the memory stick that you buy you plug it plug it in it would connect to this channel so it will not make your memory slower it will increase the capacity but at at the cost of you have to pay more 
right? And you're going to get more bandwidth in some cases. So if you're not utilizing the two channels, in this case, I would assume the first two, the first two memory already is plugged on two different channels. So that way, it's already maximized the bandwidth that you can achieve. All right. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answers your question. But you might have noticed when you plug the the memory in, you see that the the memory actually has this pins looking thing, right? The the copper looking interface that you attach to the motherboard, right? At the end, right? That the 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 thing that looks like a plug where you you have this like uh like gold slash copper looking uh, uh metal, right? Those are wiring that go to your motherboard. Each one of them is like one wire, right? So as you can see that that's a limited resource because if you want to have more bandwidth by connecting more wire, because the more wire you can have, the more data you can push through in one unit of time, right? It basically means that your motherboard will be longer and somehow have to, somehow have to support this additional wiring, right? So that also would cost you more as well and if you look at the design of your motherboard it's already like as big as it can be in many many cases right so this thing is kind of hard to scale in many many cases so the, the conclusion is things can be as ex expensive and that trade-off right and now let's motivate what are the current uh well Current memory technology that you will use. Uh, there are also new technology that comes out that is in the high-end server grade GPU and things like that. We're gonna, we are not going to talk about it in detail today. Today I will talk about what is common for your desktop, for your laptop, and for many data centers. All right. Uh, one of the technology is called SRAM. This is used everywhere, including the GPU. It's called static random access memory. Anyone heard of the word cache? When you buy a CPU, it's like it'll come with some L1 cache, L2 cache. It's the memory that is really small, built with SRAM, sit next to your CPU, and that these things are really fast. So it costs a lot to get the SRAM cache, but they're really fast. They're really fast. Uh, how fast compared to your DRAM, for example, if you want to compare to DRAM, it will be about 10, 15, 10 to 20 times faster. But the reason why they cost more is it, it built from fixed transistors. And the, the, the SRAM cell works this way. You have the when 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 I look when you look at this design, when you see the dot, that's a not logic. You flip from zero to one, one to zero. And you might see that those things are typically let you amplify the signal, flip the one to zero, zero to one, and you loop them over and over and over again, right? This allows you to trap your data. Electrons come in, it get trapped there forever. You drain electron out, in there there's nothing forever. Right. This allows you to store data, essentially. Each of these triangle-looking thing is two transistors to build the NOT gate with this uh, like a small amplifier to make sure that the, the electron will rotate in there forever until you no longer need that data. All right. Now, this four transistors for storage. Then you have two more. Connect to this to access. Basically, the, the other two act like a switch that you can open and close. That allow you to, when you close it, allow electron to flow in. Or if you want to write zero to that, allow electron to flow out, so that becomes zero, right? So you need six transistor for for SRAM, one bit SRAM. Imagine like in your CPU, for example, you have four megabytes of SRAM. Basically, you have four million of four million multiplied by eight because this is one bit, right? An array of four million multiplied like 32 million of this SRAM cell organized in some form to make sure you can store four megabytes of data. 
Now, the next technology is called DRAM, Dynamic Random Access Memory. These are a lot cheaper because it turns, uh, consists of one transistor for the switch to access, then one capacitor. The capacitor only job is to store electrons. So I can draw the capacitor using this symbol, right? And this is ground, this capacitor, and you have the transistor right here to access. So transistor becomes a switch to open and close. When you close, you either drain electron out or feed electron in to the capacitor to store your charge, right? To read from this guy is slower, but obviously, as you can see, it's cheaper. The way you organize this together, uh, the way you build DRAM, which is basically what the company like Samsung, by the way, if you haven't know already, the, the main technology that Samsung is doing is DRAM. That's their main thing. That's their main profit because they basically built it and sell it to everyone. Uh, most of the DRAM you buy are coming out from a few companies, Samsung Micron and SK Hynix. Um, these are cheaper but slower, but they're big. So from the megabyte range, you're looking at gigabytes. Your your machine own like basically half gigabyte of DRAM. And the whole thing that we have to do here is you have you need two things. You need to first trap the value so you can store the value and access by reading or writing to it, and that's it. All right, so that's a, these are the memory technology that you see everywhere, in your CPU, on my phone, in a data center, uh, in the embedded processor that goes into your smart devices, in, a, uh, in a, like any kind of chip, you'll have both of them. Why both of them? So. Uh, the, before we go there, are there also other technology? Yeah, uh, we're not going to cover it today, but you might also heard about things like time bandwidth memory, 3D stacking memory. So these are actual technology that also come out that is on the high end server and data center. So here's the trade off SRAM is fast. A few kilobytes or megabytes of SRAM. It's about one nanosecond, which is about four clock cycle. Four clock cycle, basically about the same time you can do one or two ads, one or two ads addition. So this is about the same speed as what the CPU would demand. CPU would love to have the memory this fast, right? Then as a, a DRAM is cheaper, but you have gigabytes of them, but they're slow. You're looking at something between 50, 50 cycles to 200 cycles to access a block of data in Vera, right? We will learn why there's a range not here uh, in the PCSA. Sorry about that, in the next class. Um, but the key idea is your DRAM, which is your main memory. That's where your program store your pro. Like basically, that's where your code is being stored when you run a program. That's where your data is being stored when you run a program. Those things are slow. So what do we do? Even with the new technology, it's still slow. Why is that the case? The reason why that is, it's not that the memory is slow it's just that the cpu gets faster at a much better pace right let's say you have two person running start to run at the same time but the first person is faster the second person is slower at some point there'll be more gap right between the speed between the, the, the location of the two people uh, two person you're looking at that's the cpu and the memory cpu is the faster the, the, the faster runner I can every single year see if you get faster at a better pace compared to the memory. It's really hard to get the memory to become faster. So with the new technology, even though they are fast, they're not they're not keeping up with the CPU, right? To write a fast program, this is the key. This is why we teach you this module in this class. Because if you want to write a fast program, you need to be aware of all the optimization, some of the, most of the optimization that the hardware do to make sure the program is fast. 
to measure memory access is fast, to measure access to your program and to your data is fast. The key idea is, well, they're slow, we need to hide the fact that they're slow. Because we can't avoid it. We just need to hide that. How do we do it? Uh, the thing is, right now, have you heard of the like, big data application, for example? There are many applications that would consume a lot of data, which means that it's going to span a lot of memory. It would demand your computer have a lot of DRAM. Even Chrome, for example, right now, it consumes how many gigabytes of memory on your computer? Quite a lot, right? Uh, so how do we make this thing fast? To speed it up, right? Should we always our go? Let's be greedy. Why not? We want fast but large memory. So the idea is, I know, I know that FRAM is fast and DRAM is slow but much bigger, right? Why don't we put the data that we know we can access often in the FRAM, and then the data we don't access right now in DRAM. And that's the idea behind your computer design. We call this the memory hierarchy. So we would have multiple levels of memory. When you want to access your data, your CPU check with the L1 cache, the first level of cache, the smallest guy say, hey, it's my data here. Right? It's like when you want to, like when you come to campus in MUIC campus right now, right? In Salaya campus, which is huge. There, there are going to be a lot of students in this campus, right? So the first thing you do, if you want to find your friend, right, who will take this class, the first thing you would do is you drop by this room and see if he, is, he or she is here. It's obvious, right? Hopefully they are here. That's the L1 catch. You walk in, you look around, you know whether your friend is in or not, right? Then if he or she is not in this room, what do you do? What do you do next? If you're calling that person. You maybe search this floor, right? Then you search the building, then you search the campus. So the, the, the longer you have to do, once you have to search the campus, it's gonna take a long time compared to just look into this room, right? So that's kind of like the memory hierarchy. You want to find your data. The first thing you do is look at the smallest cache that are really fast, see if the data is there. If it's not there, go to the upper level of the SRAM cache. They are fast, but not as fast as a small one, but it's okay, I will search because they're bigger, right? Then if you cannot find anywhere, if you cannot find the data from anywhere, then you go to the main memory because it's guaranteed it has to be there. So this is how the hierarchy looks like. Let's say you have a multi-core CPU, right? In most of your CPU, each core will have their own L1 cache, the first small cache. Every time you need the data, it checks this location. If your data exists, if it exists, you take the data from the L1 and go do whatever your business is. Otherwise, you go to the share L2 cache. Otherwise, you go to the main memory. If you still cannot find the data, you go to the main memory, right? And I will do a really, uh, and now we transition to the concept of caching, right? And I'll use a really simple analogy. Let's say you want to buy coffee beans, right? Let's say you want to buy coffee, you, you want to make coffee. Think of the register, the register in your register file as your cabinet in the kitchen. Do I have coffee bean right here so that I don't have to go and buy, right? I would just use the coffee bean in my cab, the kitchen cabinet. That's your register. You don't have to walk anywhere. It's right there with you. All right, that's the fastest, fastest one. Now, if it's not in the register, what do you have to do? Well, you have to stock your kitchen cabinet with coffee beans. So you go to probably maybe like nearby uh, convenience store, right? And hopefully you find some coffee bean or coffees of some form that you can drink from, right? 
And more than that, you want to get coffee and you go to 7 Eleven, can you, will you likely get, be able to buy a coffee? Yeah, right? Because the store also knows this is a common item that people buy. So they'll make sure that there's somewhere in the cooler or something, right? That's the cash. That's your cash. But let's say you are nearby 7 Eleven doesn't have it, right? What do you do? Well, you go to a nearby shopping center, a mall, some like Lotus Big C nearby, right? That's your memory. Hopefully they stock the coffee. And like you, I would say 99% of the time you can get your coffee from there. Right? 99.99% even you can find it from there. Right? Hopefully they stock some coffee beans. If it's not there, how many of you guys also run into the case that you run out of memory? What happened to your computer? Super slow, right? You know, there's also one thing called swap. If you look at the, the, the performance monitor on your computer, you will see that the space that is called swap keep go up, keep, keep basically it keep going up. This swap space are basically is the space on your hard drive. It's the disk that is used as the external location to store whatever your memory cannot fill. It's full already in DRAM, but you need more memory, you put it in a swap. The problem is the reason why once you run out of memory, your computer is a lot slower is the swap really slow. Swap is like hard drive, so if I cannot go to the nearby shopping center to buy my coffee bean, going to the disk through Swap is like going to a farm in Thailand to get a coffee bean. It's that long, right? And then somehow you have like a network drive. You can think of it like I have to fly to like Brazil to get my coffee, all right? And that's basically kind of like the memory hierarchy in the high level and why caching is a good thing why caching is a good thing. And we use this concept, not just in your processor. So in this class, we'll talk about how the processor handles this. But the same caching concept is used everywhere in the internet and data center and everywhere. For example, for example, let's say you need to run a search company and you realize that people in Asia are likely to search for certain things that people in the US doesn't search. People in the US will search for a different keyword, right? One thing you can do is to put the search data that are popular for Asian people close to them, which is a data center somewhere in Asia. That way, if I search, I don't have to go all the way to the server in the United States. I just go to the server in Asia, right? That's Cache, that's a form of caching as well. I put the data closer to me, right? So we use it everywhere. We also use a web cache. For example, uh, when you open a browser to go to a new website, you might realize it takes a little bit more time to access because that's the first time you actually take all the data from the server, load it up on your machine to display the website, right? And your browser, one thing they do is they'll actually cache the content so that if you have to display the same image again, you can get it right from your hand disk rather than the server. That's also another form of caching. So we use this a lot. All right. Now, today we will talk about how your processor handle caching for the memory, right? For the memory, for your data, for your program and how it handles caching from for the CPU so that the CPU can access the data quickly. All right, any questions so far? Like for example, web cache, right? It's for your browser uh, so that you can cache the data from a server on your local machine or the, uh, the data center that, that cache like commonly searched term for certain regions. So it's, it's now for that, it depends on geolocation where you are. Right? So there are multiple forms of caching. So the goal of the thing we're going to learn now is I want to be able to cache 
the data in the memory so that I can access them quickly. All right. So here's the issue, right? Unlike software managed cache, like a web cache, where you write a piece of software to measure your data that you are accessing is in your computer rather than it's in the server. Over here is a hardware managed cache. What it means is your ISA, like 86, doesn't really allow you to manually control them. Like you can't really say, put this thing in the cache, put this address in the cache, put that address in the cache. It's managed. What gets put on a cache automatically, when you access something, there's a chance that the data you just access is in the cache and that's managed by the hardware. Why hardware? Simplify your programming experience, basically. Otherwise, whenever you access the data and you have to figure out, do I want to put that in the cache? It would be super annoying. Also means that let's say you run 10 different programs at the same time and every single program say, put my data in the cache and you run out of the cache, then you have to figure out what do I do, right? That's why soft, like that's why most of the hardware design would not allow software programmer to manage what goes into the cache. There are some exceptions, like how GPU opens some portion of your cache so you can manage on your own, but you really need to know what you're doing. Right. Uh, some of the address who have the data in the cache, some do not. Some computer allow software managed cache, like the GPU with their what we what they call scratch pad memory. It works like a scratch pad. If the programmer knows that I, I you need to access this piece of data soon, put that in a scratch pad and I can access it from a scratch pad. Thing is, this can be complicated because I don't want to have the extra work from the programming point of view to manage everything. All right. Now, uh, deciding if I should keep going. Any questions so far before we go into the basic terminology? All right. Okay. So remember, we have the move instruction that you can use it to move the data from the memory to your CPU, to the register. The size of your move instruction is up to eight bytes, right? It's RAX, EAX, so it's four bytes. It can be four bytes, it can be eight bytes, it can be two bytes, one byte. That's the move instruction you can access. The thing is, let's say you want to access the cache, right? You're trying to buy coffee beans. You saw that your kitchen cabinet ran out of coffee. You go to 7-Eleven. Should you buy just one bottle? Or should you buy maybe six or 12 of them? If you know you're gonna consume a lot of coffee, you probably need to buy more than one, right? Because at some point, you, you don't want to make multiple trips to 7-Eleven, it's, it's annoying. You want to be a, a bum and stay at home, right? Whenever you need coffee, after you play a lot of games, go to the kitchen, uh, to the fridge, and you can get your coffee, right? So caching also has its own unit of data when you access something in the cache and bring it back to your CPU. Uh, no, you, and you access something to the memory and you bring it back to the cache. You bring more data than eight bytes because it makes sense. Every time you go to the memory, that's a lot of effort. If you go there, maybe why don't you bring more back to the cache, right? So the unit is called a cache block. Sometimes we call a cache line. Sometimes it's called a cache line, right? A block can be larger than the size of your data access through the move instruction. So it's gonna be bigger than eight bytes. In your CPU, it's 64 bytes in terms of the size. Some design, some design, they will call the cache block as a bigger unit. So there's a cache block where you have a cache line in them. This is also possible as well, depending on how you design the cache. Right now, we would assume for the purpose of our class, cache block, cache line, same thing. The simplest unit, the simplest unit of the data that you can access in the cache. For your CPU, again, it's 64 bytes, which you would notice is bigger than your register 
uh, uh, side. Let's just say eight bytes, right? Each block is mapped to some location in the cache. Basically, when you bring in some data from the memory, the hardware tells you where do you go. Imagine, let's say someone walk into this room and I'm the hardware manager. I tell that person, you sit here, that person sit here. Everyone has his or her own seat based on their address. So we will use the address to tell where they have to sit in the cache. All right. Imagine the cache as this room where you have a lot of empty seats for your data. When the data comes in, I look at the address and that address will tell me where to sit. All right. When I want to access the data, now searching become easy because what? I use the address to tell where is the data, right? It also means that if I want to access an address, I know exactly where I can find my data. Again, because I can tell the location of where each data should sit using the address. I will use the same information. I got the address, I need to find my data. So I use the same information to find if the data is in that seat or not. So let's say I have an address. My program want to access some address, right? I look at the address, I know where the data is. If the data is not sitting in this room, it means it's a cache miss. It means that the data is not here in the cache. We call this a cache miss which means I want to access the data, I check the cache is not there. What do I do next? I'll go to the memory because I know it's actually that's where I can find my data for sure, right? Uh, and that's it. Um, when I want to look up the data, if I can find the data in a cache, I call it a cache hit. If it's not there in a the cache, I call this a cache miss. All right, any questions so far? All right. So what information do you need? Obviously, when you want to put something into the cache, the data has to come in because I need the data. I, I, I have an address. I want the data from that address, right? So you put the data in the cache, but to be able to search, you also need more information, right? You don't need more information. For example, you need to make sure that there's some form of hacking, right? If I want to find a student name with some name, it means that the student need to tell me what's their name in order to search for the data, right? So imagine, uh, let's say you have to run a, 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 a shipping company and you have some storage for your shipment, right? Think of the cache as the box of shipment, right? And in order to, go to access your data, which is the content inside the shipping box, you need some labeling, is that yours? You need the label to tell, is that the data you're searching for, right? We can use that to tell, is that your data? Because for example, there can be a bunch of boxes, right? I have an address, I have an address, I know that's the location of my data potentially, I still need to double check. Is that my data or is that someone else's data? Why is that the case? So let's say memory is four gigabytes. Something, some machine that's really old. Four gigabyte memory. My cache, let's assume it's only one level, not multiple level cache, right? And it's only have two megabytes. All right, I have two megabyte cache, four gigabytes memory some data out of this four gigabytes will be in the two megabytes some do not right it basically means that how many students are in muic <laughs> no so, let's say three thousand students is in the muic program right and let's say the cache is in this room this is my the size of my cache i can fit in maybe 100 students here at most then yeah, around 100 students on all the seats here, right? And I will look at the address to tell where they're gonna sit. It also means that there'll be two address or more that 
map to the same seed because I have limited number of seeding, right? Which also means that if I want to, if I have an address, I use the address to check the location or do I check that seed or do I, do I check that seed, right? Then I need one more additional information is what's the student name? Otherwise, I don't know if that my data or not. Because multiple people can take that seed depending on their address, they'll get mapped to the same seat, right? Because we have limited capacity. Which also means that if I want to search for my data, I need the information of what's their name. Otherwise, I might, I might find the wrong person that sits in the seat, all right? Uh, then basically means that inside the cache, on top of the data, you need this thing called a tag. Think of a tag as the name for the student, right? This, yeah, like that tag, right? It stores the information related to the data so that if I search the cache, I can use the tag to tell, is this the address I want or not? You also need the actual data, so that part should be clear. In order to maintain a functioning cache, you better have the data there as well with the tag. So each data has its own tag. And when you search, you go to the location, check the tag. If it match, that's your data. If it doesn't match, that's someone else's data. Don't touch. Go to the memory. Your data is in, is in the memory. Right? Now, what else are in the tag store? This is not going to be on your sample. It's good to know. For example, when you boot the machine for the first time, there's not no one in this room, right? There's no one in this room. So I better have this valid bit, which basically means that is that a legit data or is that some junk that happened to be there when I boot up the machine? Valid bit is one. Of one means that I can access the data, or zero means that there's nothing there. Obviously, you need the tag, I said earlier, right? Then the next thing you have to do with what we're going to cover next week, which is this room has limited size, right? If I need to use it as a cache for 3,000 MUSD students, at some point, this room will fill up. It also means that if I have the new person come in, I need to kick someone out, right? I need to pick who to get kicked out of this room. So that's the replacement policy bit. This is the information for me to determine who gets kicked out. Then there's a dirty bit. We'll talk about this when we talk about how to handle write in the cache when you have to overwrite the old data. So just be aware that's one more bit for the dirty bit. We are not going to talk about it in detail right now. But this has to make sure that if you modify the data in this room, your memory is aware that that data with the same address is now modified so that you can update the data in DRAM, all right? Uh, before we go to cache organization, uh, so before we go to cache organization, I think we should take a quick break. But before we go to the break, right, remember how I said when I take the data from the memory and put that into the cache, I take a lot of data. It's like when you go buy a coffee from a mall, right? You buy a lot because if you don't have, you don't want to make multiple trips to the mall. You fill the whole block. The whole block is 64 bytes, right? But your access is only to eight bytes, but you take the whole thing. You take any surrounding 64 bytes from your address with you. Why is that the case? How many people write a code this way? Something that you loop around, you have an array, then you do something with your array, and you start from A0, then A1, then A2, then A3. It's a common pattern, right, of programming. So when you access to A0, when you need A0, basically it means that I'm going to need A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6 really soon because you're in this room, right? So the way the cache is designed, it exploits two things. 
The first thing is called spatial locality. Spatial locality means that if I access A0, I am likely to access A1, A2, A3, A4, anything nearby. It's just the nature of how programmers write their code. If I access this guy, I will probably need to need to access that data, that data, anything nearby that, that piece of address, right? That spatial locality. The way I remember this spatial space, if you access something, the whole space is likely to be accessed. So I will exploit that. That's why I take the whole 64 bytes with me, even though I just access to the four byte or eight byte chunk, because even though I access just that eight bytes, the next access is likely to be on the next eight byte, which is the same block. And that's nice because I bring it in, it's already in the cache. So the next access is a hit. The second thing is the uh, temporal locality. Temporal is time. And I'll use this example as well with the variable i. That variable, whatever that address i is, i has some address, right? Is better in the cache. It, at least if it's not in the register already, it should be in the cache. Temporal means that if I access something, I am likely to access the same address again. It's just a pattern of normal programming that we do all the time. So the cache that we have right now would take advantage of these programming patterns using temporal and spatial locality so that uh, I can bring in that big block of cache and likely I'll get a lot of cache in. All right. Now, uh, Let's take a 10 minutes break and we'll talk about cash organization at 1.10. So now that you have a cash block, right? Imagine in this case, in this room, each cash block is one seat here. Each block will belong to what we call a cash set. A cash set almost works like a mathematical version of a set but it has a limited size. Some cache will allow up to maybe eight blocks in a set. Some cache will have four blocks in a set. That the, the design will specify that. So think of a set as one row here. So in this case, in this room, the size of the cache set is four, uh, five. You can have four, uh, five students sitting in that one row. All right, then, the memory address that you get, basically your pointer value, whatever the pointer is, that the location, your address, will be mapped to a certain set. So let's say you have a pointer A, it might be mapped to that first row. It basically means that whenever I want to access the data, it will have to be going into that first row of seats here, to that set only and not other sets. Why is this nice? basically means that if I look at the address, not just knowing that it has to be in this room, the data it has to be in this room, the data will be in the front, the, in what row? In what row, right? Um, this would allow you to search easier. You don't have to look everywhere. You just go to that row of seats and you can find that person, your data, right? Uh, you can kind of draw the whole thing this way. Basically, you have a bunch of cache blocks. In this case, you have only up to two cache blocks per set. Then your cache, in this case, let's assume it can store 16 blocks. Basically means that there will be eight sets, right? And let's say I have an address. And then address A somehow, it go to map to set one. It means that every time I try to access address A, I don't have to check anywhere else except for set one. So if it's there, it has to be in set one. The same go with another address, address B. And let's say address B map to set four, I don't have to search any other set. I just go to set four and check, hey, cache block eight, is that mine? Or is cache block nine mine? If one of them is my data, I can take the data and go back to the CPU. If not, I go to the memory. It's a cache mess. All right, this way, when I have an address, I don't have to search every single block. I just go to the set and search 
the block in the set only, and that's it. All right. The step to search the cache, we call this lookup. Because the data in DRAM is way bigger than data in the cache, right? So not all data in DRAM are being cached. It means that I need to check the cache if my data is there or not. We call this lookup. The way you do the lookup is you uh, divide your address into multiple set of bits. The first set of bits, we call this the index bit. The index bit tell you what set do you go to. So let's say your index bit is 110. 110 is six in decimal, so you go to set six. If your index bit is 000, zero, zero you go to set zero. It's as simple as that. And the index bit will come somewhere from your address. All right, so that's the first part. We will do the breakdown soon, all right? There'll be three parts to using the breaking down this bit. The next thing is the tag bit. The tag bit is like your name tag. We will use this bit to check is that your data or is that someone else's data? The, uh, now, each address will point to a unique byte because your, your, your address can go anywhere in DRAM. It can go to byte 7, byte 10, byte 13, right? Any individual byte can be a valid address. So when you have a cache block, which contain multiple bytes of data, usually 64 bytes, when you have a cache block, the last n bit of your address will tell you what byte are you accessing. So let's say this is your cache block, right? And let's say this is your address. This portion at the end will tell you, are you accessing byte zero in the block or byte 60 in the block, for example, depending on the bits here. So if the bits here is zero, 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 it means that I go to the first byte in my cache block, right? We call this, uh, I usually call this byte in block bit. What byte are you trying to access in the block? And you can calculate this, how many bits is required using the size of your cache block. So let's say your CPU has 64 bytes cache for the cache block, right? The cache block size is 64 bytes. It means that I can access each individual byte in those 64 byte range, which means that I need block two of 64 bits to tell, am I doing going to the first bit, the first byte, second byte, third byte, or whatever. So let's say you have 64 bytes blocked, right? In this case, the bit n is going to equal to log 2 of 64, which is 6. Right? So there will be 6 bits. The last 6 bits will tell you you go to byte 0, byte 1, byte 2 in the block. The next, the next set of bits are the index bits. And because the index bit correspond to the set do you go to, so let's say you have 16 sets, it means that my index bit has to have enough bit to tell is that set 0, set 1, set 2, set 3, set 16, right? I mean, set 15, 0 to 15. The number of bit used is going to be uh, in that case log 2 of number of sets. So let's say I have 16 sets, I need log 2 of 16, which is 4 bits. If I need four bits, zero, 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 it means I go to set zero, right? One, zero, zero, zero means I go to set eight, right? Because I just convert this to decimal, that's the, that's the set. If it's one, 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 I go to the last set, which is set 15. And that's enough because I, I don't have set 16. I only have set zero to 15 because I have 16 sets, right? Again, if I have 16 sets, it starts from zero, go up to 15. So I just need one, 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 and that's it. I don't need any more bits. So you need log two of number of cache sets for the, the M. The rest of your address, the rest of your address is a task. So let's say this is your address. This is your address. And let's say it's a 64-byte cache block, right? 
six, let's say it's a 64 byte cache block, this six bit will be the byte in block bit. This is used to tell what byte are you trying to access in the block. In this scenario, let's say in this room, right? This byte in block bit will tell, okay, that, that seed is the first seed, second seed, third seed, fourth seed, and fifth seed, for example, right? What byte are you trying to access? Now, this part is the index bit. The index bit, let's say I have 16 sets, right? In this case, four more bits here. Four more bits from 0, 0, 0, 0, which correspond to set 0, to 1, 1, 1, 1, which correspond to set 15. All right? The rest are the tag. When you compare the tag, you just take the tag bits. Look at the block. The block will have its own tag bit. If it's the same tag, that's your data. If it's a different tag, what does it mean? Let's say the tag is 20, and then in the cache block, at set, and you, you want to go to set 7, for example. You go to set 7, your tag is 20. You look at cache block at set 7, that, let's say, and let's say there are two blocks there. The first block has a tag. 14, the second block has a tag 21. What does it mean? It basically means your data is not there. It's a myth. You then have to go to the memory using the address to access your data. But let's say the tag in the cache block, one of them is 20. It means that that's your data. Because why? The tag are the same. So the upper part of your address are the same. The index also match because you go to set seven. It means that the first part, the tag is the same. The second part, your address is also the same. That's definitely your data. That's definitely your data. So if you compare the tag and it's a match, that's your data. You just go into whatever byte you're trying to access and take it back to your CPU. You can never have two address map with the same tag. Uh, unless unless it's, it's in the same cache block that goes to the same set. Yeah. Think about it the other way. Your address, right? If the tag doesn't match, means that the two address is so different because the tag bit is the upper bit. Definitely different location for sure in DRAM. And definitely that's not your data. Let's say your data is here and the tag doesn't match and it's the address up here, right? That's why the tag doesn't match. That's not your data. You want to access this guy. And because we say that in a set, right, in a set that can be any number of blocks depending on the configuration, there are multiple types of caching. The first type we call this direct map cache, which basically boil down to one, one block per set. Every set only have one block. We call this, this thing direct map cache. So the cache block only have one single block in them if the tag match is there, so you have the index bit. But when you have the index bit, you just go to that, that block and you, you will either find your data or not there. To search, check, check the index bit so that you can go to the correct set, then check the tag bit, and that's it, right? If it's not there, it's a cache bit, so you go to the memory, you take your data from the memory, go back to the CPU. Right. Now, that's a direct map cache. My question is, is this a good design? Obviously, this is a simple design. Every single set has one block, right? The thing is, I can also write a program that only access two addresses, but I have zero caches. I can have a program that looks like this. It's a loop that access address A and B. I have access to A and B, right? And I will say A go to set zero. Both of them go to set zero. And I just made, need to make sure this tag is different. I have to access, both of them go to the same set and they have to have different tags. And my program will go access A, access B, and then go back to access A. Forever. 
Then A B A B A B A B. I might have 10 megabytes of cache. In theory, I should be able to put A and B in the cache, right? Definitely enough room. I have 10 megabytes, I have two access, that's like 16 bytes of data at max, right? Actually, that's that's like so small compared to the size of your cache. The thing is, because it's direct map cache and they happen to go to the same set. When I access A, I will put A in the cache. When I access B, I go to the set, A is there. So it's a myth. I go to the memory, I take B, and I replace A with B. Now B is in the cache. The next access is to what? To A. The next access is to A. Happen to be the same set. I go to the cache. Now B is in the cache. So I go to get A from the memory. I kick B out, put A back in. But now the next access is to B. Right? So this is the downside of the direct map cache. You, you only have one thing in the set. So if your access happen to always go to the same set, you're screwed. Like the cache becomes almost useless. All right? How do we fix this? The idea is quite simple. Allow the cache set to contain more than one block, right? In that case, let's say I can contain two blocks in the set. A and B can be in the set, right? So now my access to A, B, A, B, A, B is all ahead. Then you, what do you mean? Oh, oh, so basically mean make a set bigger. So that I can contain two blocks. I will have fewer number of sets. I will have fewer number of sets, but each set contains more blocks. Uh, this is the design we call set associative cache. Set associative cache. And the idea is I'll have my set contain n blocks. It can be one, I mean it can be two, three, four, depending on the design choice, right? Uh, each cache block is like one single unit, and in the set, you put multiple multiple blocks in. You put multiple blocks in. And we call this n-way set associative cache. Basically, what I am trying to say here is, in your processor specification, sometimes if you go deep into the white paper on how, how the detailed specification, it might say my cache is a four-way cache. Literally, that means a block, there are four blocks in a set. If it's a eight-way cache, it means my set has eight blocks. So that's your cache uh, spec, right? What's the downside of this? Downside means that this is not as simple to build in hardware anymore. Why? I have an address, I know what set do I go to, so that's the easy part. The next not so easy part, I need to be able to compare the tag in the hardware. Which means that if I have eight blocks, I need to I need to compare eight things at the same time and see is that mine, is that mine, is that mine, is that mine. Right? To do this quickly, it's not trivial to do in hardware. So it can cost some extra transistor to build this thing. You can also go to the extreme, fully associated cache, one cache set, everything is in there. It's like the set is this room, I walk in, I need to search everyone's cache. So that's the idea. Number of ways is equal to number of blocks in the set. The block can be placed anywhere. This is like the most flexible, but also the most costly. So we can use this, to be honest, Something that looks similar to this is used in a lower level cache because it's small enough. But in the upper level, like, so cache usually has multiple layers. The smallest one is the quickest, right? And then the upper layer is much bigger. So you would use like a four way or eight way set associated cache for the bigger ones. So that it's still not too, not too slow. <coughs> now, uh, should I go? Actually, let's cover this next week so that we can have more time on the in-class exercise on assembly. Uh, any questions so far, by the way? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, great question. Cache is actually 
on chip, which means that when you buy your Intel CPU or AMD CPU, that CPU has a cache. So basically the way it works is like this. You have the CPU right here, right? And in here, there's like a, the ALU, the processor. So this is like, this is like the processor, right? Then there'll be a big, pretty big area, to be honest, cache. So it's really close to your processor. And then the memory is here. You just connect my uh, connected with the motherboard. And then over here, there's like a the the CPU also have this thing called memory controller, which controls the clock and operate DRAM. So yeah, when I talk about the cache, this a uh, this is a memory that sits on the CPU, super close to the processing core. That's why that's another reason why they're really fast. Great question. Uh, now when we are back next week, we'll talk about insertion and eviction policy. Basically this dictates if I have a new block coming in and my cache is full, who to kick out. All right. And I mean, you could probably think of like some simple design. For example, it can be something like H base, kick the oldest guy or kick the block that you think you're not going to be used anymore based on frequency, this block is used 10 times already. I might want to keep this block, this block used once, maybe kick this guy. Or something else, right? So think about it. What would make sense based on uh, your programming pattern, basically? Random. Random is also a really, really valid solution in many cases, actually. So modern patch uh, is kind of like a mix of, a mix of these things. There are some structure, but there are some random elements that built onto them in case that you have a program that access in a pattern that doesn't really work for the default one. So if it doesn't really work for the default, why it, it tries to detect that and throw some randomness into it so that it works much better. Right. So let's wrap up the lecture part now. Uh, we will basically now transition to the in-class exercise. Uh, you can also, if you want to take a look, uh, actually one, one more thing, quick thing about organization, right? So let's assume I have a four megabyte cache. I just want to do one example of like calculating number of blocks and calculating number of sets, right? And let's say I said it's a four way set associated cache. And the cache block size is 64 bytes. Give me the number of sets. And then give me for the address. What are the bits that goes into the byte in block? What are the bits that go into the index? And what are the bits that goes into the tag? Right, so let's do a quick break here. By the time the break ends, uh, maybe like five to 10 minutes. Uh, I will hopefully have some, some idea in mind on how to approach the problem. You don't have to have the full answer, but we'll go over this example, all right? Again, for megabyte cache, uh, 64 byte block, four way set associated cache, which means that each set has four blocks. Number of sets can be calculated with division and multiplication for sure. Then based on that, once you have the number of sets, you can get the index bit, you can get the tag bit. The byte and block bit, because this is simple, you know the cache block size already, it's lock of that. Lock two of 64 is six bits. I'll give you this for now. All right, so let's do a quick break. We will be back with this example. Much earlier resume time, all right? So you have four megabyte cache, four base associated cache, which means that one set has four cache blocks, which means that one set is going to be 64 multiplied by four bytes per set, right? There are 64 multiplied by four bytes per set. Number of sets is going to equal to my, the size of my cache, which is four multiplied by 1024 multiply by 1024, right? 
เมกะไบต์วันเมกะไบต์เซนต์เทอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร์มอนิฟอร